Alright, we are back again from the Hug or About Future Studios on the RC3 Remote Congress 3 this year, sadly remote, but we'll do as we can. Um, we have a really nice talk coming up here about type theory in linguistics and about meaning in linguistics from Daherb. Uh, he will be talking about um, the uses of type theory in both programming languages and natural languages and maybe draw like uh, similarities between them. He has a PhD in uh, computer science, uh, was in Sweden for six years at a university and is now back in Germany. Um, there is sadly no translation for this talk because there aren't enough angels to do all the translation work. Uh, there is a pixel flute behind me, it's my own implementation, so if you want to spam me, you can. I'm not sure if it will work, but apart from that, um, I think that's enough of introduction. Let's go to Daherb. Thanks, and uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I would call myself a computational linguist, um, even though my PhD officially just says computer science. Um, and I see myself in the tradition of this slightly outdated XKCD, uh, where people try to use computers to uh, test linguistic theories. Um, in addition to that, I spent uh, my time in Sweden in a very well-known functional programming group, and basically next to a research group uh, dedicated to type theory. So my interests are both into functional programming and I got a little bit spoiled also by type theory, and that inspired me to give this talk. And to start, the question is, what is meaning in natural language? So I came up with a few examples, example sentences, and um, the question is, what is the meaning of these sentences? Um, but before we dive into that, a little bit about uh, linguistics. So there are several subdisciplines in linguistics, and one is syntax, um, which is mostly people drawing trees. And people are really good at drawing trees these days. Uh, on the slides, you can see various uh, formalisms, uh, how people draw trees, and that's pretty well established these days. Um, but that's basically what are valid sentences in a language. The next question is, what is the meaning of uh, these sentences? And within linguistics for a long time, semantics was something you would not really try to approach because it's really, really difficult. But actually, uh, semantics is the literal meaning, and um, in addition to semantics, we might have the meaning in context. So this is a very great example of so-called pragmatics. Question, your greatest weakness? Answer of uh, the person interpreting semantics of a question but ignoring the pragmatics. Could you give an example? Yes. So in this example, um, the person only um, looked at the literal meaning. Can you give an example? Yes, I can give an example. Not uh, interpreted as uh, the request to actually give an example. So we have the literal meaning and besides that we even have uh, an additional meaning in context. Um, so if we look at uh, statements in natural language, we might have challenges in interpreting what do they mean. All men are mortal, every man is mortal. That we can interpret pretty literal. Yesterday it was raining, tomorrow it will be raining. Um, the first one could be a literal fact. Uh, the one about the future, who knows. Then there are statements about uh, things that could potentially happen, it could be raining. Then there are statements which in our world could never uh, actually happen, like John is searching for a unicorn. It's pretty much a matter of fact that there are no real-life unicorns. 
So if Tron is searching for a unicorn, we don't really claim that there might be unicorns in our world. And then we have questions like, could you pass me the sword? Where we don't really have the literal meaning or we don't care about the literal meaning. We don't care if the answer is yes or no. Uh, what we actually, uh, what the person making the statement actually means is, please hand me the salt, please pass me the salt. Um, and in addition, there is kind of a, an assumption that there is actually salt on the table. While we don't really assume that if so John is searching for a unicorn, that there is a unicorn, if someone asks the question, can you pass me the salt, um, there is actually salt on the table. Um, so meaning is a very ph philosophical uh, problem. Um, and why do people care about it? Um, there are relevant questions. Uh, for example, when are two statements equivalent? When do they mean the same? All men are mortal. Does it mean the same as every man is mortal? Or a bit more challenging, I saw the morning star. I saw the evening star, I saw Venus. Um, as a matter of fact, these three are meaning exactly the same, but if someone says, I saw the morning star, do we know that they actually saw, also know that they saw Venus, that the morning star is the same as Venus? And another relevant question is, when does one statement follow from other statements? And especially in computational linguistics, we want to find automatic ways to uh, decide these questions. Uh, there are a few more examples. So um, if there is a, a very well-known example, all men are mortal, Socrates, Socrates is a man, so we should come to the conclusion that Socrates is also mortal. Or more challenging, every European has the right to live in Europe. Every European is a person. Every person who has the right to live in Europe can travel freely within Europe. Can we answer the question, can every European travel freely within Europe? And hopefully we find some way to answer this question with a yes. Uh, humans are, or people are usually pretty good at deciding this with a little bit of uh, logic and a lot of intuition. But uh, computers are really bad about intuition. Um, so we are interested in models that, uh, or ways that actually also work for con uh, computers. And these days there are basically two big branches. The one are the formal approaches, and the other are the statistical approaches. The formal approaches use logic to um, try to answer the questions while the statistical approaches just look at, at, at plenty of data. I shouldn't say just, uh, they, they use lots of data to uh, answer the questions we are interested in. Um, in this talk, I will only focus on the formal approaches because I, pr I like them more, um, but both, of, both approaches, both kinds of approaches have uh, the right to exist and can be also very helpful in their uh, own way. Um, so back to the kind of the title of the talk, now slightly paraphrased, type theory and semantics. And there are basically two uh, big approaches to type theory. Okay. What is type theory? Um, in computer science, type theory is the study of what systems of types exist and how, uh, what properties do they have. Um, we will shortly see what, uh, what that could mean. Um, so the, uh, um, if we go back in history, then there are simply type languages. Um, they go back to uh, Alonso Church, I think 1940. Uh, 
he described the simply typed lambda calculus. And then uh, a few decades later, a guy called Richard Montague uh, used this approach or uh, adapted this approach, uh, which was purely from logic to uh, natural languages. And Richard Montague um, was a very particular person. Um, he was uh, he had a great influence, but also um, he was not an easy person. He um, openly attacked uh, colleagues, and but his influence on linguistics um, started in the 70s, and there are still people trying to work out details about his theory. Um, Now we come to the uh, to one uh, uh, one answer. What is meaning in linguistics, and that's so-called truth conditional or model theoretic semantics. So, what is uh, the meaning of the sentences like "All men are mortal"? And the meaning of this sentence is, can we come up with a model which is kind of a picture of a world that makes this sentence true? And here in the picture, we have an example of that. We have the set of all mortal things. And we have the set of all men in our world. And they are a subset, meaning every Every, everything that's a man is also a mortal thing. And then we have the second sentence which says Socrates is a man, which means we know that Socrates is one of these objects in the set of all men. And then is the question, is Socrates mortal? And because we know that all men are in the set of the mortal things, we can answer this question quite easily with yes. So one approach to meaning of natural language is, can we find a world in which all the properties uh, are in a way that all the sentences we are given are true? And because we look at models, it's called model theoretic semantics. And the big uh, influence of Montague was, um, as I mentioned before, there was already the theory by Alonso Church of the simply typed lambda calculus, which was an approach in logic. Um, and then there came around Montague and made the statement, this very bold statement, there is in my opinion no important theoretical difference between natural languages and the artificial languages of logicians. Indeed, I consider it possible to comprehend the syntax and semantics of both kinds of languages with a, sing a single natural and mathematically pre precise theory. And that's a really bold statement because we know that usually uh, if we, for example, look at programming languages, uh, they are very small and very well defined compared to what, natural la what we can express in natural languages. Uh, but yeah, he made the statement and then he started to demonstrate that this is actually possible. Then uh, let's look a bit at types. And I called this a simply typed language. And um, we can give, uh, we have infinitely many types. Um, and every object in our logic language or yeah, in our logic language has a type. And the type is either E for an entity, T for truth value, or if we have some type alpha and some other type beta, then we have this pair alpha beta, which is a type. And 
then logicians try, uh, like to be very precise and they say nothing else is a type in this language. And that's again very rather abstract. Let's look at some examples. Um, we have certain classes of words in our language. For example, we have names. Um, and they, our examples are, for example, John and Mary. And we have uh, the semantic type E, which is a basic type. And then we have intransitive verbs, which means verbs that don't take a direct object, uh, like sleeps, or transitive verbs that have a direct object, like loves. And then we have sentences and they have the semantic type T, which is, as a computer scientist, I would call it Boolean. It's a truth value. It's either true or false. And intransitive verbs have this type of a pair E to T, um, which we, for example, could interpret as a function from entities to truth values. Um, and then I have a few examples down here. So what's in these double square brackets? That's our natural language. And what's not in italics uh, and not in these double square brackets? That's our logic language. Um, so for simple things like the name John, we just claim that there's some object representing John, we call it just J, the same for Mary. And also sleeps and love, we translate to uh, just our some object in our uh, logic language. Um, but what are these exactly? Um, there are two ways to look at them. Um, sleep prime, for example, is either the set of all objects that are sleeping in our world. For example, the set only consisting, uh, only having the uh, element John or J representing John. So John is the only sleeping uh, entity in our world. Or we can represent it as a function from entities to truth values. And the function returns true if x is a sleeping element in our world and false otherwise. And if we define it the following way that j is uh, mapped to true and m is mapped to false, then we get exactly the same representation as with the set before. Um, in set theory, that's usually called a characteristic function. So Either we can treat it as a set or as a function. Um, in this case, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the next question is, what is love? And, or love prime to be uh, precise. And uh, while sleep is a property of an entity, uh, for each entity we can decide if it's sleeping or not, love is not the property of one entity, but it's a relation between two entities. Um, so it's either a set of pairs, or it is a function which takes two parameters. And as soon as we apply it to one of the parameters, we end up with a second function. So the function with two parameters represents the relation between two entities or two individuals. Uh, but if we apply it to one of the parameters, um, we get a function which is um, the property, uh, for example, to be loved by someone. Uh, just to keep uh, in mind, um, for uh, pr uh, simple predicates, um, sets and functions are equivalent. And uh, for these 
relations, um, it's either pairs or it's a function. And if we apply it to a, uh, one of the arguments, we get another function. Um, one of the driving forces behind uh, the theory of um, Montague is compositionality. And um, that's usually attributed to uh, Frege, even though he never really expressed it that way. But uh, one of the most uh, well-known interpretations is uh, the meaning of a compound expression is a function of the meaning of its parts and the way they are syntactically combined. So if we go back here, we kind of have our simple, uh, simplest parts. We have our names and we have some verbs. And we have rather simple um, interpretations, what they mean. And now the question is, how can we combine them to form uh, for example, the meaning of more complex sentences, or in general of sentences. And for that we need a little bit of syntax. Uh, syntax tells us in, uh, how we can combine these elements to form sentences. Um, so the rule syntax 1, for example, says if we have a name and an intransitive verb, we can combine them to a sentence. And the second rule, syntax 2, says if we have a transitive verb and a name, we can combine it to an intransitive verb. Now we want to look at the meaning of sentences like John sleeps. And the meaning of John sleeps is, is um, the if we uh, interpret the meaning of sleeps and that's a predicate which can be applied to an entity or an individual to give a truth value and John is of type E so we can apply sleeps to, jo uh, to John and we get as a result sleep prime applied to John Or the slightly more complex uh, example of John loves Mary. We can first apply the same uh, semantic rule that we can apply the rest of the sentence to the subject of the sentence. And then we have to interpret loves Mary, which is this function that takes two parameters and then is first applied to the object and then to the subject. So the meaning of love and marry is kind of the predicate of to be in, in a state of loving Mary. And then we apply it to John and we get the meaning love, Mary, John. And now um, the question is, how do we actually come up with these semantic rules? Um, so how do we know that we have to apply loves Mary to John? And that's where the types uh, give us guidance. Um, so we know that loves Mary is of the category IV, intransitive verb, which has the type E to T. And we know that John is of the category N, which is of semantic type E. And if we see E to T as a function which takes an E as a parameter to produce a T as a, resu a result, then we know that we can apply loves Mary to John. Um, then I already before mentioned uh, the, the word lambda calculus or lambda expression. Um, probably not everyone knows what, uh, what a lambda expression is. Um, it's kind of the solution to a very almost nitpicky problem. So if we have some formula, some expression like x squared plus 2x, what does it exactly mean? And then we could come up with a 
just putting numbers instead of x. And if we put one, we get the result three. And if we put two, we get the result uh, eight. And if we put the uh, x equals three, we get 15. Um, but what we usually mean is it's some kind of function which takes a number and then maps this number to the number squared plus 2x. That's what we mean, but it's not really written down precisely. And that's where logicians uh, came up with a new operator called lambda, which can introduce a variable and turn an expression which is not completely clear like the one we had before into a function. So if you write lambda x, x squared plus 2x, we know that it is a function which has a parameter which we call x. And we um, use that in our expression x squared plus 2x. And then we can apply this, for example, to 1, which means we have to replace all x's in our expression by 1. And then we get the, exactly the same results as we had in our informal um, expression, but now it's on a proper foundation. Um, why do we need that? Um, because we actually have kind of higher order types. So we know uh, that the type e to t is kind of a function from uh, individuals to truth values. That's the same for common noun like man, bird, and so on. Um, but what is um, what is the type of uh, what we call determiners or quantifiers? Some, every, the. Um, so the meaning of man is just man prime or man prime of x, the same as sleep as we had before, or la uh, yeah, as we has had with sleep before. And the meaning of every, now we use this lambda. Um, because the meaning of every is for all things x, which are individuals, if they meet some predicate p, then they also meet some predicate q. Um, that's, again, very abstract. So let's have a look at an example. So the meaning of every man is We have a new uh, semantic rule meet, meeting our types. So the type of man is e to t. And the semantic type of every is this a slightly more complex type, but it's a function from e to t to something else. So we know we can apply the determiner to our common noun. Um, and then we do our lambda magic and we end up with the term lambda q for all x man x uh, implies q x meaning for all things if they are man then they do something or they have a certain property and if we now look at every man sleeps we apply every man to sleeps. We just had this um, term on the previous slide. And the types for q, e to t, and for sleeps match. So we can just put that in there. And the meaning of um, every man sleeps is for all individuals, if they are men, then they sleep. And that way we get a theory 
uh, how we can translate expressions of natural language into expressions, uh, into logic expressions for which we can try to find models. So we have this truth conditional semantics and it is compositional in the way that the meaning of a complex expression depends on its components. The meaning of every man sleeps depends on the meaning of every man and of, of sleeps and on uh, ways how to combine them. And these ways how to combine them are determined by the types we use. So we have some very nice method of computing meaning in a compositional way into a logic. So that looks already pretty much like what Montague claim claims, um, but it has certain drawbacks. And for that reason, um, and also because in uh, logic and computer science, the research progressed, um, people came up with so-called MTTs, modern type theories, uh, or the original is called Martin Löw type theory. Uh, so this nice bearded guy on the left is uh, kind of the person who invented everything. And the nice person on the right in, uh, who likes to climb mountains, um, uh, he used a, to be a, pro oh, who is a professor in the group where I was uh, doing my PhD. Um, used these type theories, uh, these modern type theories, uh, to express the meaning of natural language in a slightly different way. And I'll give a quick glance at uh, what changes they have. Uh, but first, um, one of the big advantages of these, uh, or one of the biggest applications of these modern type theories is usually in computer science in proof assistance. So uh, one of the most, or one very well-known proof assistant is uh, the one with the logo on the right called Coq. Um, another pro dependently typed programming language is uh, the language Acta, which is, both of them are used quite extensively in formalizing uh, and verifying for example, proofs in mathematics, uh, verifying and proving properties about uh, programs, um, but they can also be used to reason about natural language. Um, so the, a different approach to meaning in language is the so-called so proof theoretic semantics. So before we looked at what models can be uh, how models can be used to express conditions under which uh, things can be uh, can be seen as true. Um, and now we care more about proofs than about truth. And that goes back to logic and computer science again, where um, it's usually referred to as the uh, Curry-Howard isomorphism. Um, it's that proofs in mathematics can be expressed as programs in a computational framework. And that allows us practice practical reasoning on computers. Um, and informal, if we want to prove something A, we can construct a term or write a program T of this type. And an example is at the top of the slide, um, where we kind of want the first it's a function and it's the function from a semantic representation of the sentence every man walks um, to the sentence John is a man and finally the sentence John walks so we want to we have the two sentences every man walks and John is a man and we want to uh, get to the conclusion or want to figure out if it is a conclusion that John walks. And this is a small proof in the proof assistant cock, where we can, in a few lines of cock code, find the proof that actually from the sentence every man walks and John is a man, we can conclude that John walks. Um, 
The first big extension um, is we have more expressive types. So before we had the type E for entities and the type T for truth values. Um, the, actually, the type T doesn't change a lot. We now just call it prop, the type of all propositions. But uh, for common nouns like man, which were um, properties E to T, uh, properties of individuals, we just introduce new types like man, book, and so on. And for verbs, for example, we define them as functions from one of these types to property. So not just from any individual, but from meaningful domains. So for example, um, if the meaning of talk requires that whoever is talking is actually human, because except for a few situations where other things could talk, uh, it's usually only humans that talk. And the meaning of mortal is something has to first be alive to be mortal. That's um, already nice, so we can limit um, our domains of the predicates to very meaningful things. In where humans uh, or where people intuitively would say that makes sense. Uh, but then we end up in a problem. Um, for example, if we have the, me the meaning of Socrates is Socrates is of type man. And we have mortal, but mortal is of this type uh, from it takes a parameter that's animate and returns a property. Um, and now we want to interpret Socrates as mortal in pretty much the same way as we did it before, or uh, in a similar way as we interpreted things uh, before. So we want to apply this meaning of mortal to Socrates, but we have the problem that man doesn't match the, uh, the type animate. Um, so how does that work? And the answer to that, to that is we can assume subtypes or we can introduce subtypes. So if we assume that humans are animate and men are human, uh, then we can actually apply the function that takes an animate object as a parameter to something that's a man. And also we want to uh, assume that modified objects like a heavy book should still be a subtype of book. And fortunately we can do that in this theory. And um, the final thing is um, some functions, so we can already rule out some some things with the uh, here. Um, if we say that talk only works for humans, we can already rule out some nonsensical things. But we can use a little bit of this proof theoretic a bit more. So if we have this now is. Um, I hope it's not too distracting that it's a bit of a weird syntax. We define a new type which is consumable and we define two objects that are consumable. It's bread and wine. And then we define a new type of action with the two actions. One is eat, one is drink. And then we define a new type performance which depends on both a consumable object and an action. And then we can construct objects of this uh, performance by using this constructor perform. So the meaning of drink wine, for example, could be perform wine drink. But we can also in this setting define the meaning of eat wine as perform wine eat. And that's usually something we want to rule out. We want to have uh, only to be able to drink wine or to eat bread, but not to eat wine or drink bread. And that we can do by defining a new type of, for example, edible and drinkable objects. And we define eat bread as um, edible bread, 
and drink wine as drinkable wine. And then we modify our action and performance that the action of eating needs an object of this type edible for the thing we want to consume. And this object is kind of the proof that whatever consumable we want to eat is actually edible. And then we can still define drink wine in a pretty similar way, but we cannot uh, find any way of performing eat on wine because there is no way of uh, constructing an edible uh, object for um, for wine, uh, which is a very powerful thing of modeling how our real world happen, uh, happens to work. And that pretty much concludes my talk. Uh, here are a few references. Um, and now I'm open for questions. Right. So, so far we have one question I see. And the question is, so how far can we take this? Uh, has um, has anyone ever formulated a sufficiently detailed type system for or English or at least some variant of English which can be used to reason about human written or even informal text so like a algorithmic uh, language um, processing? That's a very good question. Um, and that's one of the big weak spots of this that it involves lots of work and uh, these days a lot of um, research and effort is more on statistical mo models where you hopefully where you hope that the computer might learn these things um, there are a few there is for example a data set so some logician sat down at some point and made uh, many sentences in um, this style like every European has the right to live in Europe and so on um, I think it's a few hundred sentences and that's kind of the, the benchmark where people try to test the systems. And that kind of works. I think now the, there are systems that can cover the whole benchmark and give the right results. Um, but there are other data sets that are not created by logicians but by everyday people crowdsourced on the internet and there it's much more difficult to actually agree on what is the conclusion. Okay, so the main problem is that there aren't any uh, curated big enough data sets to, to check uh, the uh, algorithms against? Or? Mm, mm, that's part of the problem, uh, but it's also, yeah, it's really difficult to make that work for the complete language or for really big parts. But um, if you have a small application, a small domain, then it's definitely a feasible thing to do. And um, it gives you also an explanation why one sentence follows from another, either by giving you the model in which these sentences are true or in the um, modern type theory by giving you a proof. Uh, so there is lots of research in doing that without logic and with just machine learning and they seem to be pretty good, but um, then it's, sometimes the system just gives you the wrong result and you have no idea why. Okay. And yeah, that's the balance. So you get the highly reliable results from this system, but you have to do a lot of work to get it working. Or you use a machine learning system which works much broader, but if something goes wrong, it's much more difficult to figure out what is exactly going wrong. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Gordon in the IRC, uh, live.hack.media, for anyone who isn't there yet. Um, how you not manage to mention uh, low, uh, L O G ban, Lodge ban? I'm not really sure on how to pronounce that. Um, I don't know too much about Lodge ban, um, except that it's an um, um, artificial language that I think was designed to have a clear semantics, probably something like um, 
first order logic. Um, so the, the approach is different and um, these people at le who work on this, um, which I presented at least, could pretend that they work with a proper English. Um, even though some people could also turn it around and say they defined a nice uh, formal language which just looks very much like English, but it's actually it's a formal language. Okay. And we have Bob asking whether there is any effort to create a combination of a statistical and logical approach. And if not, why hasn't it been done or what are the challenges? Um, there are definitely approaches that try to do that. Um, yeah, the question is where do you put the machine learning where, uh, and where do you, do you put the logic and what parts you can replace by uh, machine learning, for example. But there is definitely approaches. I think one is called CCG Lambda by people in Japan. Um, yeah, so there are definitely these approaches. Okay, and we have uh, Klondike asking whether there is any work on trying to infer types and rules from the corpuses. Um, um, I'm not really aware of that, anything like that. Uh, did you try generating valid sentences by random? Um, depends on what you define as valid sentences. Um, one answer to this question would be, I once wrote a, a Twitter bot which generates random sentences which are all tot tautologies. So I used many of these techniques I presented to uh, present uh, uh, to generate natural language sentences which all have a certain logic um, structure. And if you have a system like that, uh, generating is usually not the big issue. Anal analysis is usually the bigger issue. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Uh, where I can get the context to um, about the XKCD cartoon. Maybe you can back, go back to the slide. Um, and they want to know whether you can say something about why there are many competing syntax trees for the same language. So, or more like, which tree is exactly for where there are the differences? Um, in this, um, the main difference is. Um, how much effort you want to put into the analysis? So the the uh, syntax tree at the bottom uh, at the top left is basically textbook uh, level. Uh, it gives a very simple analysis, and um, from a linguistic point of view, people could argue what exactly is, for example, this category cop for copula. And um, the other two sentences are kind of. I don't want to really say competing syntactic theories. So there are lots of theories how to where they try to explain how natural languages work. Uh, I said people are really good at drawing trees, but they still struggle to explain certain things. Um, and over the last almost hundred years, people came up with lots and lots of theories how syntax actually works. And um, these series usually have uh, nice advantages and, uh, on the other hand, drawbacks. So the syntax tree on the top right is called uh, combinatory categorical grammars, and it uses um, categories which are also kind of function types. So np slash n can be uh, seen as a function which takes a n on the, as a parameter on the right and generates an mp. So the syntactic categories are kind of uh, in parallel to the semantic categories. And that way it's easy to translate from the syntax tree into the semantic uh, representation, while for other um, syntax formalisms it might be more, di more challenging to, to do that. So it strongly depends what you want to do, how to express certain concepts. Um, yeah, it goes a bit in the direction of this XKCD um, 
I can subscribe to any dozens of contradictory models and still be taken seriously. Okay. Um, are there any issues on these trees with garden path sentences? Um, I should know more about garden path sentences because it's one of the um, main examples where things go wrong. Um, I, at the moment, I cannot really answer that. Um, it's. I try to give a simple, high high level uh, overview of it. Uh, there are many interesting problems, garden path sentences, donkey sentences, uh, where syntax or semantics or both can go wrong. Okay. Uh, so far I don't see any more questions. So um, I would like to know from you, how does one get into well, type theory or uh, language analytics or semantics? Uh, hanging out with the wrong people um, or yeah so uh, computational linguistics is a pretty established field these days so it's what people call interdisciplinary it's um, taking a lot of computer science and hopefully still a bit of linguistics and then you try to tackle certain problems and uh, one of the big problems of natural language is what do they mean and when you study that for example uh, then you get some you learn something about it and if you're curious about it you can put research into it and to be honest uh, my research was com something completely different it's but uh, the topic of semantics was kind of one of the reasons why i wanted to to do some more research and stay in academia okay thank you um uh, back again to AI language processing. Uh, do you think yeah. there is a kind of new, bigger field coming? Uh, well, there was the last few years with natural language processing getting more and more accessible to the public and better. And do you think that there is like still a chance for only like, analytical approaches, or do you think that AI will be in the end more prevalent? Um. So actually, if you look at uh, the research output in recent years, then you you only find a little bit about what I was talking about, and you find a lot about um, what I have listed here as statistical approaches, especially language models. Um, I guess most people who haven't been away from the internet in the last few months have at least heard a little bit about, uh, for example, GPT-3, which is one of these fancy AI models which you can use for generating text uh, based on some, some sentence to start the text, or people even implemented a, a dungeon crawl text adventure using it. Um, so that's the hot shit in, in research, kind of. Uh, but these suffer from this problem that um, as soon as something goes wrong it's really difficult to figure out what's going wrong and you need shitloads of data. Okay, we have uh, some more questions just came in. Um, we have some book recommendations in the RRC if anyone is interested and we have one person asking uh, whether a function word like conjunctions or some grammar like that clause can be present in type systems? Um, so I haven't, I, I haven't done anything about conjunction and so on. Um, in the simply typed language, um, they are just translated to the logic operators. Um, so you have, and you only have usually conjunct conjunctions on the sentence level. So you could make sentences, John loves Mary and Mary sleeps. And because the type of sentence is T, which is truth value, which is kind of a Boolean variable, you can use Boolean uh, operations on it. So you analyze the first sentence, and then you analyze the second sentence, and then you check if the logic conjunction holds between them. And if you translate that in into models, conjunction can also be translated into the set operation of um, intersection. So conjunctions are 
conjunction disjunctions like the function words and and or are pretty easy or still rather easy to express. Um, there is still many many challenges which in to which I couldn't go in the time. Okay, I think that answers the question from before. Uh, there is also a new one. Uh, this for all thing, I always thought that required dependent types. Did I miss something or is that actually wrong? Um, the if, if it was simply a typed language, then it doesn't require uh, dependent types. Um, there is an um, there is an equivalent um, to uh, the for all in dependent types of the, uh, independently typed languages. Uh, I think that should be the pi types, which are dependent function types. Um, but in a simply typed language, you just have the for all operator. Okay. Uh, are there new questions? Oh, I think they are. There are. Uh, can you recommend an intro to linguistics or a book? I think we just had some, but maybe you know some off the top of your mind, which um, are quite good. So, uh, except for the the ones I have in my literature list, um, there are a few books by a professor called Emily Bender, which she co-authored with other people. Uh, one is about syntax, one is about semantics, and I haven't read them myself, but I think they are uh, pretty good from what I heard. Because they also bridge between the linguistic knowledge and the requirements you have these days with more computational. Okay. Uh, I think... Uh -huh. I'm not sure uh, whether the no is uh, directed towards me or you, but uh, apparently some of these were only programming language books, so probably the ones in the IRC. There is also a question relayed from Twitter um, whether semantic web still is a thing in your community. Um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a community on its own, and um, I don't know too much about it. Um, it it's definitely still a thing. There are still people working on it, but um, I cannot say too much about it. Uh, I think there was um, probably going in this direction a new uh, new attempts for a multilingual uh, Wikipedia, where you use a semantic representation uh, for the Wikipedia page and then use that to generate um, the articles in various languages. Okay, I think the and of course in the and IRC are al already mm -hmm. satisfied. Uh, maybe another answer to the semantics webs, the semantic web, uh, and in addition, an answer to a question that was before about actually inferring these types somehow is so what what you what you can do with these types, especially with expressive types, is you kind of create something that's called an ontology, which is in a way, a representation of the world. Um, so what I try to do I here is I define what is edible, what is drinkable. Um, and it's tedious to hard code all these things about the world. And uh, a lot of this is represented in either uh, data sets or, for example, in the semantic web. So people already put effort into encoding that somehow, and then you just need to extract it and use it. Okay, um, we all are already at the end of time. There is three minutes left. Uh, we have one more question. I think after that we'll close it. Um, are you aware of natural language hard wavy formal hand wavy formal text uh, or like codes of law which have been type checked? Um. I know that there are people who uh, spend their whole PhD on trying to formalize logic texts, uh, not logic, law texts. Um, I think there was also some work on formalizing GDPR, uh, but 
I heard about a few of these things, but I'm not fully aware of what's available and where it is available. Okay, so if you don't have anything more to say, uh, say so. And apart from that, I think uh, we are done here, at least for my part. Yep, then uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>